Well, welcome everybody to this uh, special WebEx presentation of our Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Jeff McDonald, and I'd like to thank the Global Institute for Water Security and the Global Water Futures Project for underwriting this uh, seminar series this fall. And today it's a, a real pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, Tim Burt from Durham University. Term, Tim is an emeritus professor of geography, having retired uh, just a few months ago after a, an illustrious 40-year career that uh, included a stint at Huddersfield Polytechnic as an assistant professor, and then uh, his main career at Oxford University, and since 1996 at Durham University. Tim is an international thought leader in hydrology and water quality, and he's done pioneering work in hill slope hydrology, looking at nitrate, uh, biogeochemistry, uh, soil erosion, and carbon loss generally with his collaborators at Durham University. Uh, he's currently chairman of the Field Studies Council and a member of the UK Environmental Change Network's Statistical and Technical Advisory Group. Uh, Tim has had many honors uh, throughout his career. A few recent ones that I'll mention, he's a 2012 recipient of AGU Fellowship. Uh, he was elected in September 2012, uh, or 2013 I should say, as a fellow of the British Society for Geomorphology. And just this year in April, he was awarded the 2017 David Linton Award by the British Society for Geomorphology. Uh, Tim is going to give us a talk today uh, discussing the value of field hydrology or field approaches. And I think this is really appropriate to some of the things that the class has been talking about this term. Uh, I'm delighted to have the group with us here via WebEx. And I know that uh, we're all looking forward to Tim's talk today. Tim. Thank you very much, Jeff. Well, I'm sorry not to be with you in person, but uh, things are as they are. So the talk is here and ready to go. So I thought we'd do it remotely rather than not at all. So I want to talk about the value of fieldwork in the hydrological sciences. And I'll perhaps start from a, with a quotation from a, a paper that Jeff and I wrote uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and the quotation is there clearly for you to see. Fieldwork's primary purpose must be to teach our students to be curious, to look, to collect data, to test existing ideas, to develop new hypotheses, including outrageous ones. And we'll work our way through some of those ideas as we go along. Um, my geography teacher at high school used to say, where did it first happen for you? And by that, he meant, uh, where did you first know that you wanted to work in hydrology or geomorphology or the geosciences? Um, uh, what was it? Was it something that happened quickly, or did it just creep up on you? Um, well, he was an inspirational high school teacher. And you can see Jim in the top two photographs here. Um, in the top right, uh, he's in a quarry on some hills just to the south of Bristol. And it's an unconformity, um, first described, I think, in the 1840s. Now, unconformities are not particularly rare around the world, but I think they are exciting uh, features. This shows some horizontally bedded Jurassic strata, about 150 million years old, uh, over the top of some steeply dipping Carboniferous limestone, something over 300 million years old. So there's there's 150 million years of deep time um, between the, uh, the, unconf the, the, the erosion surface and, and then the new beds on top. So you've got to have rock forming, uplift, erosion, uh, submergence, more rock forming, uplift, and erosion, and so on. And the top left photo shows the same erosion surface. Uh, a quarry company kindly removed the overburdened Jurassic limestone, and we're going to quarry this and were then stopped uh, from doing so. So you have there an erosion surface of some indeterminate age, probably uh, maybe 180 million years, 200 million years. Um, and uh, I, I just think these sorts of features are fantastic. And if you're shown these sorts of features, uh, this is bound to get people curious and, and hooked. When I was first at my high school, which is bottom right, uh, I remember Jim sending a, a friend and I out to measure the width of the main road outside the school to see how wide it actually was compared to how wide the red line was on the map. And uh, probably these days, he, he, he couldn't get away with that through health and safety. But um, anyway, we survived, and uh, 
And it was experiences like that that got me interested in field work. Just a very brief bit about my career um, as a student. Um, it's basically in three parts, reading, lab work, and field work. First of all, I went to Cambridge as an undergraduate geographer, uh, where we very definitely read geography uh, in the traditional sense, very little lab work or field work. I was taught by Richard Chorley, top left, one of the great physical geographers of the uh, 20th century, uh, and a real revolutionary in terms of how geomorphology changed. Uh, I managed a little field work from my undergraduate thesis on terra sets, bottom right, um, but I did a lot of reading, and that was a brilliant foundation. Then I came over to Canada and did a master's at Carlton in Ottawa, which was all lab work, getting water to move through frozen soil and making measurements of that. So I learned some laboratory techniques, which, were, uh, which was an important skill. And then finally, I got to Bristol um, and worked on small catchment hill slope hydrology uh, with Malcolm Anderson, who's pictured in the middle photo, doing work on hill slope hydrology and links to water quality. And um, as you'll hear a little later on, I, I, I took what was basically a 2D model of hill slope hydrology and tried to think about what would happen if we added in the third dimension. And so we're looking at hollows and spurs and, uh, and flow pathways down the slope. Since then, as Jeff said, I was at Huddersfield, where I got interested in peat erosion. Then I went to Oxford, and that's really where the nitrate work took off. And um, I also got more and more interested in long records of one sort or another. The bottom left shows the Radcliffe Observatory in Oxford, which has the oldest uh, weather station in the UK. And um, I ran that station for 10 years and am now writing a book about it. And just before I start the lecture proper, it's always good to thank those people that uh, one's worked with over the years. Um, and as you can see, they include Fred Worrell and Nicholas Howden from the UK, Gilles Pinet from France, and Jeff, um, who's been a good friend and colleague for a, a good number of years now. So I want to start by asking, where do our ideas come from? How do we get curious about the real world? And I think that crucial to being curious and getting new thoughts is the importance of field work and the importance of field data. Here are some Oxford students from, I guess, nearly 20 years ago, very cautiously looking over the edge of a cliff, looking at the uh, quaternary deposits on the top of this hill, uh, and beginning to think about, well, how did they end up here, and what's happened since, and so forth. And a Canadian quotation is very apt, of course, this afternoon. Um, Curiosity is the very basis of education, and if I tell you that curiosity killed the cat, I say only the cat died nobly. And we're all curious about our subject matter, and we want to ask questions and to obviously test out our ideas and take our subjects forward. So field work is terribly important in this, um, terribly important when we're students being taken out to the field. Uh, Terribly important doing our own field work when we're doing field research, collecting data, um, thinking about the landscape, um, and uh, looking for uh, new ideas and, and, and new outlooks, um, because science doesn't stand still. And the things we see in the field make us think and make us develop our ideas still further and further. Photo at the bottom, by the way, is the, uh, the Henry Mountains in Utah. Uh, and it's where G.K. Gilbert developed his idea of convex divides of hill slopes. And the students there are looking at a very shallow uh, landslide caused by winter saturation of the, uh, the weathered layer. Um, now, here's a story I often tell against uh, one of my Oxford students, Mike Slattery, who now teaches in Texas. Uh, Mike was working on soil erosion and got me out just before Christmas to look at... Um, what was some fairly modest erosion, but he was excited, and so it was my job to share his enthusiasm. But I did say after we'd looked at these rills that you can hardly see on the bottom right and the deposition at the bottom of the field, uh, top left, I said, well, we should just look around, and if there's been erosion here, we should just look over the hill and see um, what else might have happened in some other field. So we walked about 500 metres 
off to the left, looked over the hill and found some beautiful examples of erosion, partly running along the tractor wheelings and a lovely Talweg rill running down the bottom of this little dry valley. So um, it's always good to look around and to think about what you're, what you're seeing. So that's just a little bit by way of introduction. And what I want to do now is to run through a couple of case studies, the first one in some detail, um, and just to show the way that data and field work and field observation tie in together to help us understand uh, a particular issue and to um, take forward our ideas and, and develop the subject. So I'm going to talk about the nitrate issue, and I'll talk very largely about this lake, Slapton Lee, which is down in southwest England. Um, it's held up behind a shingle ridge from the sea, so to the, the right uh, marine, but this is definitely a freshwater lagoon, and it's fed by um, a number of streams uh, which drain into the lower lee, which is the open water. The higher lee is sedimented up and is really a marshland, and then you've got 50 square kilometers of catchment uh, running down into the lake. And the size of these circles here just show local concentrations of nitrate in the river water. And basically, as you come lower in the catchment, uh, you move from livestock um, grazing to arable agriculture, and the nitrate concentrations in the local streams go up. Um, and and I, that's just a bit of sort of background start. Slapton Lee itself, the largest natural lake in southwest England. It's a warm, moist climate permeable soils over impermeable bedrock, so it's classic landscape for the development of shallow subsurface flow, sometimes called through flow. They've been monitoring water quality in the streams and the lake for the best part of 50 years, and over the years a lot of hydrological process research has been done there, trying to understand the mechanisms uh, as well as the, the response of the streams. And importantly, the lake and the surrounding land is a national nature reserve, so it's an important uh, site and uh, somewhere that one wants to conserve and protect from pollution. And why did the monitoring start in 1970? Well, basically because people were, were worried about nutrient enrichment, eutrophication of the lake, and um, the development of algal blooms, which were then, I suppose, unusual, but of uh, stayed with us, and if anything, seemed to be getting worse and worse every summer. And it's this context of uh, nutrient enrichment and how it is driven by the hill slope hydrology that I've been interested in over the years. So here's the uh, record for the Slapton Wood Stream, which is a tiny little stream, but it's been where we've done a lot of the process research. And you can see there basically monthly data plotted based on, on weekly observations, weekly sampling. And the red line shows a 12-month running mean. And you can see in the first 15 years, the concentrations were generally rising. And from about the mid-'80s, things flattened off. And in the last decade, they've begun to fall. The crucial number you need to know there in terms of nitrate is actually 11.3 which is the legal limit for nitrate in drinking water and, in fact, the legal um, the target, really, for um, nitrate causing eutrophication. And so the European uh, Nitrate Directive looks at both eutrophication and drinking water quality, uh, and that 11.3 is equivalent to 50 milligrams per litre of, of nitrate, NO3. Uh, the 11.3 is just the N part of that. So that's, in a sense, the raw context. Uh, when we started our work, I was first involved from the late 70s, we were worried that the nitrate was going to rise inexorably and get up above 11.3 consistently. In fact, that hasn't happened, but there have been episodes when the water has got above the legal limit. And that water sampling is backed up really by studies of small watershed hydrology, looking at processes. There's a large hill slope hollow you can see in the large photo um, with water converging into that hollow, flowing down slope, bringing nitrate with it. And then these streams are monitored usually by some form of Zenosh weir. And, um, and so we can measure the flow and the concentration and work out the load of nutrient or sediment which is moving 
down to the lake. And in the winter, when the soils are wet, uh, we can see these very distinctive double-peaked hydrographs, two phases really, a quick flow response when it rains, and then a delayed hydrograph two or three days later, which is when the through flow comes through. And what happens is that the water tends to build up on the plateaus and then drains downslope uh, towards the foot of the slope. And you can see the way that the saturated zones in the maps uh, down at the bottom um, gradually um, join up with the saturated wedge at the bottom of the slope and flow down um, to, to, the, to meet the stream. Um, and that's our basic model of the, the winter runoff. And these double-peaked hydrographs turn out to be quite important in terms of major episodes of nitrate leaching. And it's curious that I found the same double-peaked hydrographs in my PhD work uh, uh, on the Quantox, which is about, I suppose, 100 miles from, from Slapton, um, the same two phases, and an observation at Bicknell are also that these delayed peaks are associated with uh, additional solutes in the stream and their major leaching episodes. So we begin to link together through our field observations uh, the water quality and the hydrology, and we learn more about the process response system that we're interested in. And those are, in a sense, the schematic of the nitrate delivery pathways, uh, leaching of the soils, uh, and then lateral flow down slope. Sometimes that returns to the surface as return flow, and very often it stays certainly at, 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 uh, at Slapton, uh, more so really than at Bicknoller, it stays subsurface and flows straight into the stream. So we can think about short-term process and we can think about longer-term watershed change. There's the Slapton Wood Nitrate record again. And we can do some export coefficient modeling and extend back beyond uh, the period of observation using a fairly simple crude land use model and um, we can get back to what we think would have been modestly pristine conditions at the end of the First World War when the concentrations were probably down below two. It was probably never nutrient poor. This is a lowland temperate uh, basin, but nevertheless, the nitrate concentrations have clearly risen uh, many fold over the last century. And if we look at the biggest of the rivers that flows into, uh, first of all, Highley and then the Lower Lee, you can see the same pattern for the River Garra as for the Slapton Wood Nitrate. So we can be confident that what's happening in our small catchment where we've done the process studies is mirrored in the much bigger catchment. The concentrations are lower. That's because it has up catchment sort of headwater areas which are, um, are grassland rather than arable. But the drivers are much the same and uh, the shifts in land use over time uh, have been the same. The recent decline is probably due to more sensitive farming. Most of the nitrate comes from agriculture, and um, as farmers have got more concerned about uh, the cost of, of uh, inorganic fertilizer, they're more careful with it, and that does seem to be producing uh, some uh, improvement in the nitrate. Now, nitrate is not the only nutrient which is affecting the lower lee. We've also got a phosphate uh, pollution problem, and we've got long-term data, both our own and from the Government Environment Agency. And um, you can see here in blue the phosphate records for uh, the river, uh, and the pink shows uh, the lower Lee levels. You can see that things have been falling um, steadily, really, over decades. That, I think, is because there's better control and uh, protection against soil erosion, probably also uh, less phosphate fertilizer being used. The soils tended to have been saturated in phos phosphorus. Uh, but I'll come back to the balance of nitrate and phosphate shortly and worry about whether we've got uh, good water quality or not in that lake. So is Slapton Lee nitrate limited? Um, you would think probably not, because there's a lot of nitrate around in the rivers and streams. Um, but if you look at the bottom graph, you can see the seasonal pattern of nitrate concentrations. And in the middle of the summer, in most summers anyway, 
um, the nitrate is completely taken up by um, the uh, flora, uh, both the, the, the large plants and the algae, and nitrate seems to fall to a low level, probably too low a level, which encourages the blue-green algae, uh, which are toxic and nasty things. And, um, and so it may be, although there's generally plenty of nitrate around, there's not enough in the lake in summer, and, um, uh, and, and that's a, a bit of an issue. So have we got to good ecological status by 2015, which was when the EU Water Framework Directive wanted that to be achieved? Well, uh, we haven't. Um, might we get there by 2027? Well, I think that's open to some debate, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, the National Nature Reserve has a management plan, which it's required to have. And here's what its management target for summer nitrate is a value of 1.5. And it looks as if we're getting there, um, and that seems to be the case. Uh, but as I've already explained, maybe there's not enough nitrate in the summer, and it might even be that we need to add nitrate uh, to the lower lee in order to um, favor uh, things other than blue-green algae. Um, and so there's an issue about whether that 1.5 is the right level or not. It, it may well be. The current level for phosphate is set at 0.1, which is way too high um, and, in fact, refers to, to ph phosphate in drinking water. Um, when we start to delve into this a little bit more, we find that we need much lower levels. For the River Gara, the water quality seems to be high, um, and mostly um, our summer levels are uh, acceptable, very acceptable in the river. But when we go on to the lake, and there's not much record here, and I've got the wrong label I see at the top, it shouldn't say PO4P, it should say total phosphorus, TP. These are total phosphorus records, so this is what's in solution, it's what is bound to sediment. And the Environment Agency have had a couple of periods when they've done sampling of total phosphorus. We need to start more of this. Um, on the whole, the lake water quality is poor um, and doesn't even get into uh, the moderate status uh, very much and rarely into good and high quality. And the reason for this, we think, is that phosphorus is being released from the sediments. And uh, what we need um, is uh, for that phosphorus to gradually be leached away, and then maybe the lake will improve in water quality. But at the moment, water quality is generally poor because we don't meet the total phosphorus target. And one area where we have a real lack of research is in in-lake water quality and, and biogeochemical cycling. And um, that's an area which needs, um, which needs more research. So we've, we can a ask some questions on the basis of observations. Uh, it then needs some field experimentation to, to take that forward. So we're a bit glum about water quality in the lake, and there may be quite a long legacy before things begin to improve. And that's really demonstrated by the pH target for the lake, which is 9, and you can see that pH is generally looks as if it's getting worse and is very rarely below 9 in the summer. And that's because um, the pH r rises as photosynthesis by algae with, uh, withdraws carbon dioxide from the lake water. So the pH goes up, and those blue-green algae uh, are causing high pH. They're being driven by, um, by high phosphorus in the lake water. And they're probably also being favored by low nitrate. And, and so there's a real issue. The one success story has been that we have dealt with human sewage. And uh, that's much reduced in terms of its inputs into the lake. But that means the sediment sources become relatively more common, uh, more important, and particularly the in-lake uh, sources, the bed sediments, uh, are a real problem. There's a comparison with the lake in Scotland where legacy phosphorus took 15 years um, after the major sources were uh, cut off before the lake began to show signs of improvement. So some of these legacies could be quite long. I don't think there's a big legacy of nitrate here because there's no deep groundwater. If we were in um, a catchment like the Thames, which has a lot of aquifers uh, as well as intensive agriculture, then there may be very long 
legacies there as well. So there are unanswered questions, the need for more field research at Slapton, uh, particularly in the lake. Um, and uh, the lesson, I think, is that uh, when we collect data and when we look at our results, um, it very often raises more questions uh, than are answered. So in some ways, we know a lot more about nutrient enrichment at, at Slapton and what drives it, but we still have unanswered questions. Let's change the scale and the location then. Uh, oh, sorry, I just wanted to say a little bit about nitrate buffer zones before we do that. Um, some of my research early uh, this century was to do with near stream uh, land and with a process called denitrification, which can take place where water tables are high um, and the flow is relatively low. So often in buffer zones, uh, riparian zones between slopes and streams, uh, we hope to get denitrification, and we can even plan for that by putting in buffer strips to, uh, uh, to, to give the best chance. And we've done work at a number of sites across Europe. This is our French site in Brittany. The stream runs across the middle of the photograph from left to right. And as the water comes down off the fields and goes through the marshy area, there is denitrification. And you can see the nitrate disappearing as you move away from from the upland riparian interface, and uh, the nitrate falls. Now, that could be other processes than denitrification. It could be uptake by vegetation. But in a neat little proof, we can show that it's one and not the other. Here's the evolution of nitrate across the floodplain, and you can see uh, the nitrate concentrations falling in blue. You can see that the nitrate in vegetation has no preference for uh, N14 or N15 vegetation, but in the soil water, the N15 builds up, and that's because the soil microbes take the N14 preferentially, and, and so as the water moves across the floodplain, the N15 builds up, and we've got independent uh, verification that denitrification is taking place uh, and is active, uh, certainly in the winter months of the year uh, when most of the nitrate is leaching. So that was nitrate. Um, let's move to a different scale and a different um, type of problem. And we'll move down to uh, Western North Carolina in the Appalachians to a large uh, research station called Coweta Hydrological Lab, um, which has been in existence since the 1930s. Top left is Wayne Swank, a very distinguished ecologist who ran Coweta for a number of years. Bottom right. Wayne Swank and Jeff McDonnell discussing, no doubt, the finer points of some bit of hill slope hydrology at Coweta. Coweta was set up in the 30s when they were worrying about uh, land degradation, soil erosion, flooding, and how all of this tied together. And Coweta is a series of large experiments, each a small catchment, a pair of catchments, one of which gets treated and one of which stays as a control. And these experiments last a long time, as you'll see. Uh, a lot of data is collected. A lot of process work has been done on top of the, as it were, the sort of uh, crude hydrological work, the measurements. Um, and again, the more we see, uh, the more questions tend to be asked. Here's a typical bit of Coweta experimentation, changing one of the catchments from deciduous hardwoods to white pine. So you can see there are basically four phases here. The first phase, which lasts about a decade, calibrates the control catchment to the catchment that's going to be treated. Then in brown, you cut down uh, your deciduous trees, and runoff tends to increase because there's no vegetation cover. Then the young pine grows up, and the difference between the two catchments becomes less. And then once the canopy has closed and you've got mature pines, you can see that the runoff is um, considerably less from the pine catchment than it is from the hardwood. So changing vegetation wholesale can change your water resource uh, availability. And uh, if you were to cover the whole of the Appalachians in white pine, which you might do for timber production, you wouldn't do much for water supply to cities like Atlanta. 
But you can see that's an experiment that even on those data, it had already lasted 29 years. These are long, important studies. This is a study that I've done some work on looking at um, flow duration curves. Um, this is changing uh, hardwood to grass. And there's a number of phases here. First of all, there's the chopping down of the trees and the planting of grass. And to start with, in year three, the grass was heavily fertilized. It was lush. It wasn't cut. And it, there isn't much difference between the tree canopy and the grass. Then the grass was allowed to degrade, no more fertilizer, and the runoff began to increase compared to the control hardwood. Then more fertilizer, and you're back to small difference. Then, in yellow, all the grass was killed off with herbicide. Huge jump in runoff. And then the vegetation was allowed to regrow, and things have moved back towards uh, where they uh, ought to be once the woodland regenerates. So, again, it's one of these paired catchment experiments. They last a long time. They generate a lot of questions about um, what processes are going on, whether it's high flows or low flows that are changing, and how this relates to uh, water quality changes. Now, here's, a, here's something we don't understand. Here's another of the clear-cutting experiments. This was just chop down the trees, let them regrow. So a period of calibration. Um, things go haywire here in terms of the nitrate concentrations. They're low, but they shoot up by uh, an order of magnitude um, straight after the harvest. Then they fall down for a bit. And then after a decade, things go mad again. Uh, nothing's been done there. Nobody's gone in and chopped trees down or done anything. There are probably vegetational successional changes uh, with some of the early success, succession um, shrubs dying off. But, um, you know, there's a question we don't understand. Why that complete um, sort of catastrophic um, disequilibrium behavior uh, in the nitrate response compared to the control, which there's a bit of variability there. Uh, but hardly of the scale that we see um, in the treated catchment with the red line. So um, more questions to answer and uh, more field work to be conducted to find out what's going on. Now, here's the third type of field work, um, which is um, basically weather observations. But we all in hydrology, climatology, and so on, um, rely on weather observations because we need that background data. And of course, in collecting data, uh, inevitably questions arise, links, for example, between rainfall and runoff, uh, links between uh, or changes between years, the interannual variability, and then the question of long-term trends. Now, as I said earlier on, I was lucky enough to run uh, the Radcliffe Weather Station for a decade. Um, I still take a close interest. Um, it's got observations going back to the 1760s and um, a continuous set of records uh, in, written up in the sort of ledgers you can see bottom right from April 1814. So a real treasure trove of data and all sorts of things uh, to enjoy in terms of interpretation and analysis. Now, I mentioned outrageous um, hypothesis earlier on, uh, a term that William Morris Davis invented and Jeff and I picked up in our uh, quotation. Here's Oxford's annual mean air temperature um, going from uh, 1815, and you can see there's been a steady rise from the late 19th century, and um, that's a pretty typical global warming signal in my view. What does the rainfall record look like? And we've got rainfall um, reconstructed back to the 1760s. You can see after a first sort of decline, really from about the 1780s, rainfall has increased monotonically for uh, a couple of centuries. Might we be outrageous and hypothesize that global warming is increasing rainfall uh, over the century scale? It would be right to think so, because a warmer atmosphere should hold more water vapor. We would need more than just one record, but it's an interesting hypothesis. And uh, food for thought. Now, I've recently looked at hourly rainfall at Oxford. We've only really got a good record in the Oxford region for about 40 years. But we've able, been able to show for winter rainfall an increase in uh, the hourly rainfall intensity. The winter, uh, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but the, the winter 
uh, rainfall totals don't seem to have changed much, but the frequency of rainfall, the number of hours of rainfall, has fallen, and that means that overall the mean rainfall intensity has in, had a tendency to increase. And if hourly rainfall is in, intensity is increasing, then maybe um, uh, the longer term sort of rainfall totals and so on uh, may well be changing as well. Bottom right, a bit of soil erosion from the Oxford area, actually on a field of maize, hit by a thunderstorm when there was almost no vegetation to cover, and uh, a nice example of some, some real erosion along the, along the crop lines. Now, global warming is not bad news for everybody. Um, here's a vineyard uh, in the Oxford area run by um, some, some friends of ours. Um, if you look at the Oxford temperature record in growing day degrees with a 10 degrees C threshold, you can see the pattern since the 1850s in this case. Um, somebody uh, said that you could start getting fair crops of wine once that um, index gets above 945. Well, the index got above 945 in the Oxford area in the early 1990s, and so for the last 25 years, people have been able to grow commercially um, good crops of, uh, of, of vines, uh, of grapes, um, particularly if you're on south-facing slopes. That does tend to help things along. So um, we may bemoan global warming in many ways, but uh, nice to see some good sparkling wine being grown in the Oxford area. So back to Kawita and just a few um, thoughts to finish off with about the importance of these long-term studies, um, uh, which I hear call benchmark studies, and the importance of their continuity, because some of these studies are quite vulnerable to um, being stopped for one reason or another. Something like Kawita costs a lot of money to run. Even the, our environment agency just going to Slapton Lee roughly once a month and taking a, a, a few water samples for the, the basis of, of logging quality, uh, these things can cost. And it, it, it can be a real problem if you've got a, a really important benchmark study and then somebody pulls the plug and the record ceases. So we need to fight and protect the best of these records to make sure there is continuity. I've already talked about um, Kawita and the importance of those long records there, some of them going back into the 1930s, and um, long may they continue. Now, here's a record that we walked on. Jeff mentioned that I've worked on water color and water carbon. This is a water color record. Again, it's monthly data, but based on uh, daily observations from 1970. So this is a very long daily record produced by the local uh, drinking water company. Um, people don't like brown water coming out of the tap. It probably wouldn't do you much harm. Uh, and indeed, the chlorine, which is used to um, get rid of the color, is potentially much more important because there's a danger of forming something called trihalomethanes, and that can be carcinogenic. So treating brown water to get rid of color um, has to be done um, very carefully. But here's our long water color record. Uh, it's important because if color is going up, it's costing the water company more. I'm more interested in why the color is going up, because that means dissolved organic carbon is increasing. And there could be all sorts of reasons for that. It could be to do with global warming. It could be to do with changing patterns of hydrology and changing patterns of uh, leaching of carbon. It could be something to do with land use change. It could be some response to falling uh, acidification. And so there are a number of possible drivers. And the only way really to, to, to tell about this is to go to the source areas, the peat covered catchments in the headwaters of rivers like the River Tees, and to do process work um, looking at uh, water flow through the peat, uh, looking at the, the geochemistry in the peat, and so on and so forth. But again, it's a long record that uh, raises questions. You can also see in there not only the long trend, um, you can see pulses which tend to follow some of the major droughts. For example, after the 76 drought and again after the 95 drought. And uh, one of the possible drivers is damage to the peat in severe droughts. 
particularly that first big drought, which was very extreme in 1975-76. So there's interesting hydroclimatology going on, and that long record has been helpful in beginning to uh, understand uh, the, the response and to think about drivers. Here's the nitrate record for the Thames. This is one of the longest nitrate records available. Um, we had to put it together through quite a lot of painstaking work, which took us as far as Stanford University in, um, in California, because they happened to have some of the ledgers that, uh, in their special collection. Um, but anyway, there's nitrate concentrations in the Thames since um, the 1860s. Uh, the major driver here is really land use change. There is a bit of a human signature, but the main driver is, uh, first of all, plowing up of grassland in World War II in order to grow more crops. And there's a delay because of the influence of the chalk aquifer. And the delay is about, well, it, it, about 30 plus years. And so the plowing in 1940 didn't begin to show up until well, a bit showed up in the 50s, but the main response was in the 60s, when it paralleled with a real intensification of agriculture, uh, lots more fertilizer, mechanization, and so on, and, um, and, and so a double whammy, and the, the concentrations have stayed high since then and are just beginning to come down, um, but will take a long time to do so because of the deep chalk aquifer. And so there's a big nitrate legacy um, in, uh, in the Thames, if I was showing you the Thames carbon record instead, it's much more driven by human population increase uh, and much less driven by agriculture. So again, you've got differences of drivers giving different process response. This is uh, an important record. Um, the record comes from, well, two sources, either the government monitoring agency or you can go back to the water company, um, but at least there's an extant record uh, and the observations continue. Here's one that Jeff will appreciate. This is just a, a link between um, winter runoff at um, H.J. Andrews in the uh, Oregon Cascades and links with the state of the Pacific in terms of uh, El Nino and La Nina variations in, in sea surface temperature. And data like this show a driver um, which is obviously a, a clear link between ocean temperatures, uh, meteorology, and rainfall. And indeed, one can take this further and show that um, the, there's also an orographic effect that uh, the rainfall intensifies uh, at altitude with the, uh, with the wet Al uh, La Ninas. So again, a, a, a lovely long record based on both long records of, of sea surface temperature measurement and records at, at HJA uh, from uh, the watershed measurements. And finally, I suppose... Uh, my favorite record in many ways, although it's not one that I've uh, studied at all in any detail. Um, there are um, my wife and son and myself on actually Mauna Kea on Big Island, Hawaii. And over my left shoulder, you can see Mauna Loa, where in 1958, they began to measure uh, atmospheric CO2 concentrations. So there's the first couple of years of carbon dioxide concentration measurements at Warner Lower, and we might say, well, so what? Um, when they were, that's the sort of length of data you might get in a decent PhD study, a couple of seasons if you're lucky. And I suppose the one thing that you get there um, is some impression of a seasonal forcing, and so that would begin to uh, raise questions. If they'd finished after two years and Charles Keeling had gone back to scripts, maybe that would have been the end of it. And perhaps somebody would have come along uh, 10 or 20 years later and done another study. And you'd have a couple of studies, but you wouldn't know really what was going on. Uh, thankfully, that wasn't the case. Um, they were making measurements and have continued to do so. So we've got what is probably the world's most important record. Um, and this is a field record. It's field measurements of atmospheric concentrations, and that, I think, is a very influential um, geoscience record. And, of course, it raises all sorts of questions uh, uh, at a global scale. So I hope that talk has given you, at different scales and from different examples, some impression as to why 
field work is important. Um, I think it's important for students to learn to be curious, um, whether they're uh, looking at data sets, whether they're collecting their own data, whether they're just out in the field looking at what's around them um, and speculating about what's happening, testing ideas, developing new hypotheses, uh, including those that might seem outrageous, but which very often um, are proved to have a grain of truth in them. So with that repetition of uh, the uh, original quotation uh, and a photograph of Slapton Lee and some Devon bluebells, probably from the end of April, thank you for listening. And I think the idea now is to have some Q&A. Anyway, thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much, Tim. <laughs> Clapping from the studio here. Uh, we're not set up to take questions from the broader WebEx group, but we've got a few uh, hearty souls here in the recording studio, uh, and we'll ask right. you a couple of questions to finish off. Thank you so much. I know it's very late there, and Tim, that was a, really a, a sweeping talk of many of the topics you've been involved with over the past decades. Cody, did you have a question? Yeah, I can pass it to you if you like. Tim, uh, thanks for your talk and for joining us today. Um, I think we can all Pleasure. agree on the importance of uh, field research and uh, long-term data sets. I'm wondering what advice you can offer uh, new field scientists in a world where increasingly universities and funding agencies can afford to hire four or five modelers for every one field scientist. Well, I, I mean, I think it's interesting you ask that question because I think one of the concerns, and I think it's a concern that, that Jeff and I had in our uh, WRR paper, is that um, too often I think there's over-reliance on models, and, um, you know, models do require uh, good data, uh, appropriate data, um, to, um, for their, their calibration and validation. And uh, models in themselves are, you know, well, they're not useless. I mean, we can do a lot, learn a lot from models, but we do need good, valid field measurements, um, which will allow us to, to first of all, uh, test our models out and then um, to, to, to verify them. So I think the, the advice is that, um, of course, it depends on, on the precise um, problem that, that one's researching, but it's very likely, I think, to require uh, a program of field measurement, a program of field experimentation. Um, sometimes that experimentation is quite uh, loose and informal, but on other occasions it can be quite formal and the experiment can be, you know, quite tightly conducted in order to get a, a, a what one might call a more formal uh, test of, of, of the model and the, the theory that lies behind it. Um, I, I think I encourage people to look for um, uh, what other data might be available. Um, some of these long-term data sets, rainfall data or maybe some water quality data, it, it, those sorts of data often provide a, a, an important context um, for field experimentation. And, um, and so they're worth looking for if they, you know, should happen to be available. Good. Tim, I was going to ask about the double peak hydrographs. Would yeah. that have been captured by a model at Slapton or elsewhere, uh, that, that double peak behavior? Or is that something, do you think, would uh, not have been detected, say, running top model at Slapton, for instance. I wonder if modeling studies it, have... Well, I, you, I think you certainly wouldn't have detected it from top model because yeah. top model is essentially lumped. Um, Dave Butcher and I, with a very crude model, managed to, to generate um, double-peaked hydrographs or delayed hydrographs anyway. And I think a model like some of the early models that, that somebody like um, Al Fries was using, um, with the right... Um, sort of uh, calibration um, uh, uh, would it would be capable of, of generating those those double peat hydrographs, and um, I think it's an it's probably an example where um, if one returned to you know some finite element or finite difference models, um, they should be capable um, of of replicating that sort of. Uh, that, that sort of behavior. I don't, I don't see any reason why not, but I think it does require 
um, a distributed model um, of some some form or other, whether it's a 2D model or a 3D model. Um, uh, I think, you know, it, it perhaps doesn't matter. But, but I, I, yes, I think that they're, they should be amenable to, yeah. to, to being tested. And if not, you would then be sort of scratching your head and saying, well, why not? Because I think in that case, I would be, um, you know, we've observed these things in the field. And if the model isn't isn't capable of generating them, you, you sort of, you know, you go back around the loop and think, well, the model then needs some, needs some adjustment. It's a sort yeah. of test of the model, isn't it, really? Yeah. Good. We have another question here. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Um, just kind of advancing on Cody's question as well. I was just wondering if you could maybe comment a little bit on motivation behind maintaining these long-term field exper experiments. Um, you know, your Hawaii example is kind of a great example of the breadth of information that can come from these. But like Cody said, so as funds or budgets start to get cut, it's a little yeah. impossible to... Well, I think there's two levels, really. I think the, the, the large-scale sort of, you know, whole catchment experiment, places like H.J. Andrews and Kawita, um, they're important because they're at the landscape scale and um, maybe... Um, are able to sort of transcend. If you're just working on small plots, you might get edge effects and not fully see some of the things that are happening. And one hopes um, that government agencies are going to maintain that scale of experiment and expense, not, <coughs> notwithstanding I agree that they are expensive. Um, but their value, I think, has to come because um, these benchmark studies you know, do give these very long-term data sets against which we can um, gauge shorter-term problems and, and, and issues. So I think that um, one hopes that, that some of these big experiments will survive uh, and will prove value for money. Um, and part of that value for money, I think, has to come from encouraging um, sort of as it were, more experimental studies to be nested within within them so that you need people doing sort of process hydrology um, at, at the sort of hill slope scale uh, in the context where you've got um, the, the larger scale sort of paired catchment experiments. So, so I think it, it sort of behoves us all to, uh, if we've got a chance to, to, to base some experimental work at, at, at some of these places, um, we should get in there and do it so that we're we're supplementing an, uh, the the sort of um, the large scale measurement with with process work, um, and they may be more short term studies, um, but they will they're being given the right context. So I I, I think we need good process based science um, to support the um, the ongoing. Um, sort of almost sort of monitoring and, and bigger experimentation that, that does happen. Good. There are surprises to be learned. I think that's the, that, <coughs> that's the key issue. And, and it's for people like Jeff and I and others, you know, it's up to us to, to lobby um, government to make sure that, that the importance of these is, um, is understood. Can you imagine if, if they were to shut down the Mauna Loa Observatory after all these years? I mean, the, the scandal that, that would create. And it wouldn't be much different if they were to shut H.J. Andrews or Kawita, um, Hubbard Brook. You know, these are important sites and, um, and, and need, need, our, need our support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, a compelling statement. I guess it's just that often we where we encounter groups that might say, well, don't we know that? And don't our, can't we use our models to make these predictions into, our, into the future? So that, that continues to be something we argue for here, and I know many groups do as well. Yeah, well, I think the trouble is it's the sort of, it's non-stationary behavior, which is the thing that will catch us out. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, models can sometimes um, produce the right answer for the wrong reasons. And... Um, I, I, I think one of the advantages of, of data um, is that it, it, it keeps us grounded in the real world rather than just thinking, well, we've got an all-powerful computer model, so we're bound to be okay. Um, and so that would be my caution, I think. Um, that's not to knock models. There's some, 
excellent models out there, but yep. but can they deal with unexpected shifts in, I right. don't know, atmospheric chemistry or precipitation or whatever might be the case? One, one last question, Kim and, uh, Tim, and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Hi, Tim, again, great talk. I was wondering if you could leave us with some inspirational words for future young scientists who want to do some field research and have uh, nature to look forward to as their weir blows out or their field site takes a dramatic shift due to a weather event or something. And having a long career in uh, field hydrology, what are your uh, recommendations for sticking it out? Oh, I think you've, you've, you've just got to be eternally optimistic, really. And um, <laughs> you, you need to know that my PhD, um, I started off doing hill slope hydrology at the same time as the most severe um, drought in southern England uh, started. So the first 16 months of my field research was, um, you know, somewhat frustrating because um, the slopes were dry. There was almost no um, sort of slope foot saturation. And, you know, it was a matter of holding my nerve. I learned to do some other things in that time, like um, that's when I got more interested in water quality. And then suddenly the wettest autumn on record in uh, or fall in, in 1976, and, and suddenly I had more delayed hydrographs than I knew what to do with. Um, so I think one's got to maybe, you know, uh, create a virtue out of a necessity. And if, you know, if you get the 100-year flood or you get the 100-year drought or something uh, untoward happens, you know, make the most of it. Um, be positive and think, well, you know, what can I learn from this? And uh, does that give me a chapter in my thesis or another paper that I, you know, hadn't expected to, to write because suddenly I've got something to say about, um, you know, some extreme event or some unusual event. So uh -huh. um, I, I, I think make the most of, of, of whatever, you know, nature throws at you. Good. Well, Tim, thank you so much. Certainly that PhD work was... Uh really the inspiration for much of my PhD that came about 10 years later. So we're, uh, we're all eternally grateful to the many important papers you've uh, written over the years. We know you're still active, uh, and it's been a delight to, to hear this overview of some of your research uh, today. Again, thanks for coming to us via WebEx and for uh, uh, sticking it out at now quite a late hour at your time. And uh, on behalf of the audience here and the WebEx audience general, generally, uh, thank you so much again. Okay, Jeff, but thank you very much.